Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 195. Science Faction Australopithecus Africanus. I don't know how that's better than just saying Science Faction 195 or Science Faction any other topic. (laughs) Uh, We are, of course, going through the different hominids in human histories. Australopithecus africanus lived about 3.3 to 2.1 million years ago. While this is more recent than last week's uh, species, obviously, Australopithecus afarensis, this one was discovered before Lucy. This was discovered in the 1920s by Raymond Dart with the discovery of the famous Tong Child, but no one bought it for 20 years. Literally, nobody thought this was a hominid. The people were like, oh, you just got some weird monkey there. He had to like keep the bones in a box under his bed, waiting for somebody to care about the fact that he had broken open this huge part of human history, and nobody gave a shit for decades. They thought he had like, uh, just... Painted a horse like a zebra. They they didn't they didn't think that's exactly what chicanery. they thought. That's that's what they thought was going on. A lot of zebra painting. This is the, the oldest spot fossil found in southern Africa, and first one with with a parallel species. We're going to be talking about that next week when we discuss the other species that are around at this time. Compared to Afarensis, which was last week, this one has a rounder cranium housing a larger brain and smaller teeth. We're still not anywhere near homo level brain yet, but we are getting slightly, slightly bigger. And as we get smaller and smaller teeth, that's more specialized omnivores uh, like ourselves that we'll be eating. But it also has some ape-like features, still has those long arms for climbing in the trees, though as we discussed before, like its predecessor Lucy, it is fully bipedal. So we see this continuation from Australopithecus anamensis all the way through Afarensis and now to Africanus, kind of showing gradual changes, always with a slight increase in brain size, usually some dentition changes. Like afarensis, these are highly sexually dimorphic, meaning the males and females are of substantially different sizes. That hints a little bit at some of their social aspects of the groups, and it might hint at where humanity came from. Now, again, we can't say for sure that human beings came from this lineage because there are multiple lineages alive at this time, but this is a good candidate. The reason being, we see a trend toward larger brains, we see a trend toward more homo sapien-like dentition, and we see a trend towards taller, larger-brained, upright, bipedal walking individuals who are now more omnivorous, as we're going to find later on, is going to allow them to eat meat, especially later when they cook it, but that eating meat will allow them to have more protein, which allows them to feed this brain that takes up about 20% of our caloric intake, and that, of course, brings humanity with it. How much different were they from humans uh, as, in terms of gender? I ask because, you know, I can tell a human female... right because of her her curves. Uh Was there a sexy-ass curvy hominid? They were probably very curvy hominids, let me just say that. When we talk about the sexual dimorphism, if you think of your average man and woman, I don't know the exact specs, but I would say in the United States, I think your average man is, what, 5 foot 8, and I think your average woman is like 5 foot 5. At least in the species before this, in Afarensis, the males could range up to about 4'11", and the females would range up to about 3 foot 5. So you're talking substantial differences in size, much more akin to what you would see in something like a gorilla population than you would see in a homo sapien population. Our, our gender differences are minuscule compared to those. Their domestic violence cases would be way more severe. So they probably have a death penalty attached to them because right. you can't have one guy just flipping out and kill a breeding like female. She's way more valuable to the herd than you are. Here's a great example. If you want to see what these Australopithecine sexual dimorphism looks like, Google image search right now as you're sitting at home, a picture of Shaquille O'Neal and his wife. Go look at that, and you will see what the difference looked like between your average Australopithecine male and female. He should be with Brienne of Tarth. <laughs> Speaking of Brienne of Tarth, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian and hound, Damien Mercado. Damien, how you doing? I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> I, I was hoping you'd say Jamie Lannister because I've seen the looks you give me. That's right. And your newly found amputated hand. I'm going to go fuck my sister. I'll be right back. Spoiler alert. And, of course, our maester for the evening, none other than Connor. Connor, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing good. All right. And we are broadcasting this from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on out to Madhouse for their Saturday Night Showcase. And when you're not doing that, go ahead and check out our website at www.thesciencefaction.com for all the articles we cover here, as well as some we don't get to. But for now, let's get this show rolling and move right into Science Articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. 
All right, article number one, evaporation power generation. This sounds like a way that Captain Planet would suggest we power the planet, something... I actually think that, you know how they have, like, Generation X and, like, you know, the baby boomers? uh, Evaporation power generation, I think, is people born after 2020. (laughs) No, what this is is very, very interesting technology that's starting to come out. You you guys who are longtime listeners of the show know I am obsessed with alternative power generation methods. When you go into his room, that's all he has. Yeah, just just windmills and shit. He has, like, a drawing of a perpetual motion machine he's locked up. Well, I mean, I I have a couple of views in life, one is which is that we're going to go through numerous stages where we get into individual production of energy where we use it because we lose so much of our electricity. We produce all this electricity just to lose a lot of it to line loss because we produce it far away and then we push it into people's houses and then we lose even more of it to inversion and and transferring because we started doing with AC and now our refrigerators run on AC and our washers and dryers run on AC and almost nothing in our house does. Almost every other thing in your house is direct current DC. That means your TV is DC. It's got an inverter on it. Your phone is DC. That's what that little inverter plug is that you put on it. Almost all of your modern day electronics, your computer, they're all DC. We have to transfer that power. In doing so, we lose at least 30% of it. So we lose something like upwards of 40 some odd percent due to line loss pushing the power to our homes, another 30% transferring it over, especially considering most alternative energy generation methods are DC, like solar cells and stuff are DC. Well, what, I am what, constantly I'm constantly complaining that we don't have a bunch of solar cells on our roof hooked up to a Tesla wall that we can store that electricity and produce it ourselves. We'd have to produce a fraction of the electricity ourselves than we produce by having people push it our way. We wouldn't have to have linemen constantly putting up with down power lines. We wouldn't have uh, big natural disasters wiping out power for a bunch of different people. I think the way we do it is silly. I think the way we are going to see the evolution of power systems and power grids in our country is you're going to see a movement away from being on the grid to a bunch of people generating their own power using solar photovoltaic, using even small wind powers, using biogas, and then storing it in things like Tesla power walls. And then, right when we're about to start tearing down all the power lines, you're going to see a resurgence of centralized power production and the need for those power lines as we suddenly figure out fusion power generation. Because once you have fusion power generation, you've essentially figured everything out. You have an unlimited source of power. You're not going to be able to do it at home, but you can probably do it in one big plant someplace. And since you're not going to worry about line loss, because it doesn't matter, you have unlimited power, you can push that power to wherever you want it. So I think we're going to go through those periods sequentially through time. But in that period, I am still looking for all those neat things that you can build a house in the middle of the woods without having to have a power line going to it. Now, smart people like the three of us, we know why our walls give out AC current. But for some of our less educated fans, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could explain to them why our wall puts out AC current. Well, there's a few reasons. And we lose power through downed offensive linemen. Right. <laughs> Uh, there's a few reasons. Everybody knows the whole dispute between Tesla and Edison, the whole AC-DC dispute. But the reality is that it's really hard to push power long distances over power lines through DC. So we have those inverters now. Also, we didn't used to make anything out of DC current. Like, it was very rare. Most of your things that you would have, anything that had a little motor in it or anything, was done through AC. As the digital revolution came around, DC became a much more viable option. DC, which is basically the, it's constant 12 volts on, or what, however many volts on one side, as opposed to switching back and forth, positive, negative. The reason that became more useful is because we had DC brushless motors to run anything physical, but then also any kind of computers or digital stuff, they just want a constant steady signal. So as the revolution kind of moved towards a digital model with a lot of computers and that kind of stuff, we wanted more DC digital stuff before that. You couldn't find DC stuff. When we ran, started a power grid system back in the day, ev- almost everything was done with AC because it was easier to make a refrigerator motor that runs on AC. It's a- easier to make a dryer motor that runs on AC. But now we are in this field, and now we have these interesting things. Now you can get solar photovoltaics. Elon Musk just put out a bunch of solar shingles that work really, really well on your roof and look actually very good, and you, a lot of That's people are going to be terrible. powering their houses with that. I've heard shingles can be painful. So it can be, actually, I, I, yeah. Good luck to It's basically Elon. herpes of the body. Then you have things like you can buy your own personal little windmills that can make power for you. There's a lot of these kind of little things. There's solar hot water, that kind of stuff. This is a whole different methodology, and this idea is evaporation power generation, actually using the power of evaporation to generate power, which is a really interesting idea. When I first heard it, I couldn't even wrap my mind along how that would work. 
Because essentially when you're talking about power generation, you either need to directly create an electron moving through a cycle, which is what happens with photovoltaics, or you need to create mechanical energy by like doing something like some of the solar farms in the desert will heat up uh, water mixtures and then use those to run a traditional turbine. So you either need to make something mechanically move or create an electrical current. This is kind of an interesting way on how this thing works. The machine, this evaporation engine, controls humidity with a shutter that opens and closes, prompting bacterial spores to expand and contract. And they are able to use that expansion and contraction to transfer that physical motion to a generator that makes electricity. The way I think about it in my head is similar to a lot of the heat generation things that are coming out, where the expansion and contraction of an object based on the heat you apply to it, which changes its size, creates electricity. That seems to me to be difficult to create a lot of electricity, but apparently they've actually fine-tuned it quite well because they have found that the U.S. lakes and reservoirs could generate 325 gigawatts of power, about 70% of what the United States currently produces. So have they built a prototype of this, mm-hmm. or, is, yes. or is it, it's not a paper exercise? No. Now, they don't have the big ones that they're talking about that they would need for those uh, you know, massive gigawatt generations, but they do have ones that work quite well in a laboratory setting. They're small. You can actually look at pictures of them. They're somewhat spherical. They look like uh, about the size of, uh, I don't know, like a small car or something. And these things are producing nominal amounts of electricity. Now, you might say when I read those numbers, yeah, but what are they really calculating? They actually did a fairly realistic calculation when they came up with that 325 gigawatts number. They took away doing any projects in places where you couldn't feasibly do them. Like, yeah, it'd be great to do evaporation generation on this lake, but there's a bunch of people using it, or it's in the middle of a shipping lane or something, so you can't put a generator on it. So they tried to put it only in places where you could feasibly use these things and put them, and in those calculations, they came out with that number. That's really interesting, especially because the majority of this power potential is in the southwest and the west, where we get a lot of sun, uh, that evaporation is much stronger, and so theoretically, we should have much more power generation. Coincidentally, that's where we need it the most. One-ninth of the country's population lives in California. Something like 65 to 70 percent of that one-ninth live in Southern California. That means the vast majority of people in this country live in a very small area. And that very small area is incredibly power consumptive. Right now, we offset that by using things like solar farms, wind farms, all those kind of things. But if we could have these evaporation generators, one is there's less infrastructure needed. I actually happen to do a lot of work for solar farms and wind farms. I do their archaeology surveys for them. They're massively destructive to the environment, massively, especially solar. Solar is essentially clear-cutting an entire place, destroying all of the archaeological cultural resources, all of the biological resources, everything that was underneath it, and creating a sea, a dead sea of nothingness where those photovoltaic cells go. Wind is a little bit better, but you still have big pads, big turbines, big roads leading out to them, and you got to destroy a lot of stuff getting big out there. Big turbines or turbines? Because the, turbines. they're big, like a 10-gallon <laughs> yes. turbine? Yeah, well, there's a lot of seeks that work in the, <laughs> the wind generation. I, I'm tired of, of generating turbines being mistaken for Muslim, and yeah. hate crimes happen to these generations. <laughs> yeah. And you know, every time one of those generating turbines makes electricity, it has to pull its knife out and draw blood. <laughs> Okay, a hypothetical question, a little off topic. Uh If we were to come up with a viable means of clean energy like this evaporation or fusion technology, could we solve global warming by just either A, everybody turning on their air conditioners, or B, one giant air conditioner? Uh, No, because as we discussed before, the way an air conditioner condenser works, for every unit of cold, you produce three units of heat that get pushed out the back of the window. So you're actually, uh, an air conditioner is actually just a heater. But I have an air conditioning unit at my house. You just, you have to take the, you have to take the tube and Uh put it out the window. Okay. Couldn't we just take this tube and just put it out into space? Okay, so the space tube. And and then then we're just venting all over our hot air. Venting the heat. I like this. All right. It'd have to be one of those really stretchy long ones though. Mm -hmm. And those always get holes in them. Then they stop working. I mean, I don't foresee a problem with taking all of the air in our environment and putting it out into space. Yeah, who would? Because I'm only taking the hot air. I'm not yeah. taking the cold air. It's the air we don't want. One of the benefits of this particular technology is that unlike the uh, wind generation and solar generation, you can actually kind of control when it's on and when it's off and use it when you need it. So solar and wind are very on-demand things. We need grid systems, battery systems that contain that energy and then re-put it out. Because of the way these move and the time periods in which they work, these evaporation generators are actually things that you can kind of use on demand. So you need power, you turn it on. You don't, you turn it off. You don't have to always have it on to capture the power when you can use it. Is it more effective to use salt water or fresh water? 
for evaporation? Mm-hmm. Well, all evaporation by definition would be fresh water moving. Yeah. However, but, if it was fresh water, the vapor pressure of that fresh water would be higher, so you'd be able to absorb more water comparably. Which water would allow me to boost this technology by allowing me to put electric eels into this water? It's like uh, putting a fuel additive into okay, your car. Okay, I see what you're doing. Uh, so we, we we have an evaporation generator with some kind of moray eel that you're constantly Not getting moray, to shock. Okay, electric. Oh, sorry, electric eel that you're constantly getting to shock you to produce more electricity. I don't see how it wouldn't work. <laughs> You know what's funny is the way you make hydrogen is you run electric currents through water. I wonder if there's a bunch of hydrogen being produced every time an electric eel shoots off. And if so, we should capture that and use that for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. It's hard of them wasting it, not using it for space flight. Stop being selfish, electric eels. So the way this generator works, basically you have a, they say in the paper, bacterial spores, but basically it's a sponge. And when the sponge dries out, it shrinks Mm -hmm. and then when it absorbs water it expands expands, and then that's what's driving a motor to create some electricity yeah um and it seems like it should be called a bacterial generator as opposed to evaporation generator yeah yeah um and so and they've got these slats above and below it Uh um so when they want it to uh absorb water they Mm -hmm. close the ones on the top opens the one ones on the bottom uh sponge expands And you need less power, you open those slightly less, so you decrease the humidity. Basically, it's a humidity control box, and that humidity control will change the expansion rate of those sponges. And this right. this can match a DC generator of... Well, it seems to be. It seems to be quite effective. I think it's because they can scale it up very easily. You know, you run into some problems with photovoltaics, and you run into some problems with wind once you start scaling. Because this process is really dependent on environmental humidity more than anything else it seems to be much easier to scale and very simple too. The process of it is very simple. I mean, if you look at a wind turbine, it's a very, very complex device. The nacelle, the thing that actually makes the power, the the generator in there, the thing costs over a million dollars and is incredibly complex because you have to be able to change with different wind speeds. You have to handle all these different stresses that are on the blades. The blades themselves have to change all this stuff. This is very simple. This technology itself is very, it's the difference between an electric car and an internal combustion engine. You mentioned humidity. Would this source of power generation be more effective or less effective in the American South? Well, less effective than the Southwest and the West because we actually get more of that solar energy. We're able to produce more out of this. They actually have a great map on the article. You can check it out on www.thesciencefaction.com. And on that map, they actually show the hot spots of power generation. And you see it focused in the Southwest. You need a dry heat. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You, yeah, you do because if it's really humid out, the content of water in the air has to be less than the content of the water. You would in need the sponge. a dehumidifier in order to get the shrinkage. Right. And we power the air conditioner. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. I always love any of these kind of new technologies, any kind of electric generation things, especially ones that could feasibly be done on a local level level at your own house. I always find super, super interesting, especially things that don't shoot carbon into the air. And then eventually, yes, we will have fusion generators. We will, by the way, to go back to Damien's original idiotic question, we will eventually be able to fight global warming if we had fusion power because you can produce carbon sinks that actually take carbon out of the atmosphere the problem is don't get your hand caught in the carbon garbage disposal not when you're yeah don't don't get your hand down there when you're turning on the carbon <laughs> carbon on down. yeah no the problem is that's very energy intensive when you pull the carbon out of the air it, it's the process itself is energy intensive and so it, normally now it takes too much energy to do that it's actually a net carbon loss or i guess you'd say a net carbon production when you do it so it's not worth it but if we had unlimited power sources we would be able to sequester a lot of that carbon and thereby reverse the global warming effects isn't geothermal uh, an unlimited power source couldn't we build this machine above a volcano the problem with geothermal is there's only specific spots to do it we i've done geothermal plants we have a few out here in the desert uh, just east of san diego out by holtville and i've worked on those plants the problem is the same one we have everywhere else if you're only able to produce it in that one area you're going to lose so much of it to line loss trying to get it to a more populated area that it's almost not worth it well that's why the power is just going to a scrubber two feet away that's it and it looks like an air conditioning unit that we just have on in the desert so an analogous thing where, where you mentioned like line loss Right. and how if we produced um, you know, electricity on site, we need to produce only a fraction of yep, it. Yep, very small um, an, an interesting thing about this technology, it's going to be most effective in the American Southwest, mm-hmm. also a place where we're, we have a water crisis. Yes. And right now, we're, we lose a ton of water to evaporation mm-hmm. just from sitting in the reservoirs, getting them to the reservoirs. And so if we're already putting in some infrastructure to generate power from that evaporation, you know, it'd be interesting if we could also instead of letting that go up to the atmosphere, capture that, 
recycle it back to the bottom of the reservoir or send it somewhere else. Yeah, you're right. And they do. They have a lot of schemes to stop that now. They have something called armor balls, which are like literally they're like the balls you see at McDonald's fun bins. And they put these out on the water to stop the evaporation because they're losing so much of it, like you said, to, to basically evaporation. Not only that, but it would be interesting if you could find a way to mix this with desalinization. So you have this out on the ocean. The water gets evaporated into it. Now you have the water fill up those sponges. When the water gets drained out, by, by nature, the fact that it's evaporated water, it is now clean, fresh water. So maybe you could combine something that is both generating power and the output is fresh water from salt water. Very, very interesting stuff. On to article number two, how Zika got bad. Are you just not Brazilian, or you just do you just not like the Brazilians? I don't I don't understand that comment. Well, Zika, of course, the Zika virus, which made a, a huge stir in South America as it spread after the World Cup in Brazil and started causing microcephaly. Microcephaly being small, literally means small head. It caused this damage to a lot of young babies whose mothers were affected while the babies were in utero. This is a horrible disease. There's no cure for this disease, and there never will be. Once you have it, that is that is a deformation. There's nothing you can do about it. You'll never be able to regrow that. Brain brain mass. Most of these unfortunate children die very young, and if they live to any age, they won't live to a, an old age, and they will be severely mentally handi- handicapped. Wait, wait, wait. You, you, there's nothing wrong with their physical body. I mean, you could, you, there are people who, who have traumatic brain injuries who, right. who, who live for years with a non-functioning yeah, brain. Yeah, they're just not as good. You you have so many fail-safes. You have so many things that keep you alive that they don't have. Like, and like whereas my cerebellum is always telling me to breathe, they will yeah, like, exactly. forget every 10 minutes. Here's <laughs> like, breathing dicks, breathe than dicks. <laughs> my, my lizard dick brain. <laughs> What's interesting is we've had Zika for a long time. We covered on our show how it started in Africa. We think around the Uganda region. It's been around since at least the 1940s. It's been endemic in those areas, then spread to Polynesia and was there for quite some time as well before finally making its way to South America via the World Cup because soccer is evil. Well, what happened is after it made its way to South America, we started seeing these huge Zika outbreaks that caused microcephaly. Everybody's flipping out. Like, what's going on? Why is this all of a sudden a thing? Is it that South Americans are somehow more vulnerable to this particular disease? Some people theorize that pre-infection with another virus that's along the same lines, like, uh, for instance, dengue fever is very similar. If they have dengue fever, it could actually maybe cause a cataclysm reaction if they've had it before that makes Zika much worse, and that's what's causing the microcephaly in these people. This particular study wanted to look at that question. Why is microcephaly suddenly popping up to the point where we have more than 3,000 cases of microcephaly in Brazil thanks to Zika virus? They looked at a single mutation that happened in the Pacific Islands in 2013. This is when it's in French Polynesia. One mutation happened to a single gene. That single mutation, dubbed S139N, killed brain cells in fetal mice and destroyed human brain cells grown in lab dishes more aggressively than the old strains seemed to do. So that one mutation seemed to destroy things much worse. And they could tell that because they can look back to outbreaks from places like Cambodia in 2010, places in the Pacific Islands in the the late 2000s, and you can see that this didn't have this mutation and it wasn't causing these problems. So, That's really interesting because it means we're seeing things in very close time. 2013 is not that long ago. So if I, as a non-pregnant female, non-infant, got this, it would still be doing damage to my brain. It's just not on a level that I could. No, probably not. Because it's really only when your brain is forming that it's going to be causing damage to your brain. You've accused me of my brain still forming many times. That, Do I need well, to avoid Zika or you know not? What? Actually, you're right, Damien. I, I stand corrected. You are right on that one. You You might be affected. The changes in the amino acid on the Zika protein called PRM, and that protein helps the virus mature within affected cells and get out into to affect other cells. So we saw the gene, and now we see the protein that it's producing. They don't know yet why tweaking that protein makes the virus kill brain cells more readily, but they do see that it does. And to do a test, they did something really interesting. They went back to this 2010 Cambodian version of the virus that did not have the mutation. They induced the mutation in a lab, and then all of a sudden... That old Cambodian virus that wasn't causing microcephaly in rats and mice was. Now, so all of a sudden they're able to show, well, we can't say for sure, but it looks like when we change this thing, it all of a sudden becomes this really dangerous super Zika. Now, did all the people who had the Cambodian strain retroactively get microcephaly? Yeah, that's the way it works. It's like a zombie master. When the zombie master <laughs> dies, all the people it created as a zombie then die as well. Also works for White Walkers. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 
So think of that in terms of possible implications for cures. Not only does it mean something interesting for viruses we currently have, because think about it. Again, Zika was not that discernible from a common cold a couple of years ago. One mutation on one gene caused the change of one protein, which caused it to be an epidemic that ruined the lives of thousands of people. That means that those things that are around us all the time, we have viruses, we have bacteria, we have infections around us all the time. One little change. We are one amino acid change away from something horrible happening to us at any time. There's a lot of thoughts that that's what happened with the Black Plague. There's a lot of thoughts that that's what happens with any pandemic disease that spreads really quickly is there's one little change. Okay, you can drop as many hints as you want. I'm not stopping growing my bird flu. I have a lot of <laughs> cultures. I'm this close to doing something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, you and your pigeons. Uh, it's you and Mike Tyson just sitting around talking pigeon. Breeding bird flu. Yeah. The other possible implications are thinking about what we can talk about for cures. Now we know that one specific gene is causing it. Maybe we don't have to eradicate Zika. We have to eradicate the presence of that gene within populations of Zika that are spreading. How we do that is anyone's guess. You know, maybe that involves going to mosquitoes, which are the carrier of it, and altering the mosquitoes' guts so that they can only carry certain ones with certain genomes. I don't know if that's possible for this particular one, but who knows what it will be, but it does give us a target to shoot for. Couldn't we do what we do with mosquitoes and uh, release a bunch of sterile versions right. of the Right, we release the sterile virus. Zika. Problem is, that works with mosquitoes because they sexually reproduce, and so you have the sterile ones. It doesn't really work with viruses that uh, just asexually reproduce. Uh, and also, sterile Zika causes microscrotal disease. <laughs> is that what your mom told you? Is that what your mom told you? <laughs> I've never even been to Brazil, so I don't know how I got it. <laughs> I, I guess the analogous way would be you create a, a different version of the Zika virus that mm -hmm. can just reproduce much, much faster. So over time, the population balance shifts towards the and give. I guess it, the the version your version you would have to give you some kind of immunity to the next Zika that infects you, right? Because otherwise, it would have no effect. Well, if you create this new Zika that is more benign, as long as it can grow faster right um eventually it'll outcompete the other zika for all the resources and the other one will kind of just fall to the wayside and, and that happens a little bit but you have to remember with asexual reproduction there's less of that happening as you would with sexual reproduction because usually what happens is then the thing that dominates gets into your gene pool and changes you or does something like that it's a little bit harder with the a lot of times it's just a non sequitur with asexual reproduction like what does this virus care if you're infected with another virus you know but if you could do it where that more benign form gave you an immunity, it trained your immune system to fight off the other Zika virus, then you're absolutely correct. You're essentially creating a vaccination. Couldn't we do that same thing with HIV, chlamydia, things like that? So I'm actually helping to build resistances in my community. I have thought this for a long time. The next uh, step in vaccines and stuff, especially for STDs, are going to be STDs that are that are designed and given to people. So you get this STD, and this STD, you, you are supposed to have unprotected sex with somebody else to spread this STD. And this STD is benign to you, but it gives you an immunity to other STDs. So you're like, hey, did you get the new chlamydia STD? Uh, I didn't, but Poindexter over there did. I guess I got to go bang in without a condom. Fine. Stay out of my butt. I don't have my immunity to hepatitis A. By the way, how quickly would the anti-vaxxers go away when they figured out that vaccines got you pussy? When they were like, oh my god, this is great! We love vaccines! Worth the autism. Every time. And so basically, this uh, specific gene making this specific protein in the Zika virus, this is that heating vent in the Death Star. Like, we just gotta aim our torpedoes right down that little hole. It also makes the term, to take a step back, it makes the term vaccinating your children seem fucking criminal. <laughs> It does indeed. All right, let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, I call BS. It's the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS. Are you guys ready to play? I am. I, I don't remember if I... I, I'm coming off a win last week. Did you win? I don't remember that. I fucking won last I don't week. That. I, I smashed first time scientist Allison Gill. She'll grow into her doctorate's new. Ah, true. She'll be able to beat up idiots in no time. You'll be able to do this easy counter. Don't even worry about it. All right. Article number one A volcano in a fairly populated area is set to explode with a similar force to the Mount St. Helens eruption. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. It's going to explode with more power. But what they're leaving out of that is that we can prevent this just by sacrificing a virgin. It's true. You totally not me because yeah, I've had sex with like yeah. literally twos of dudes. <laughs> and Connor. 
Um, I'll go with science. You know, there's not a time frame associated with that, so I think it's easy to believe that somewhere near a populated area, there's a volcano that could erupt with the same force as Mount St. Helens. All right, article number two. A new study suggests that three or more cups of coffee a day double the risk of death among HIV and hepatitis sufferers. Damien, is this science or bad science? Well, if you're awake longer, you have more hours in the day to contract HIV. No, no, no. They already have hepatitis and HIV. You have more time in the day to work on making it worse. That's true. You can study really. Uh, So I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to say bad science. All right. And Connor. I'll go science. Um, you know, caffeine is altering your body in a couple different ways. And so if it's an added stressor to your body, then I, maybe that can cascade through and affect you negatively. All right. Article number three, a new study suggests that you can tell if a person is unfaithful in their relationship simply by the sound of their voice. Damien, is this science or bad science? Bad science. It is not by the sound of their voice. It is by the amount of glitter on them. <laughs> that is a telltale sign. Like, why Why do you look like glitter and smell like very cheap Walmart perfume? Are, are you banging an 18-year-old twink? Why are you covered in glitter? <laughs> and Connor. I'll go bad science. You know, there's a lot of good actors around, and people could probably change their voice pretty easily. Does your average person, like, like if they are cheating and you ask them that very specific question, just something about a revolution, their voice cracks? Like, no. No, never. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, article number four, a new study confirms that chimps can use simple or complex tools, but only when instructed how to do so, suggesting an interesting history of human interaction and teaching. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. No chimpanzee or primate I've ever owned intuitively knew how to use a vibrator. (laughs) Yeah, stop, uh, owning chimpanzees. I, you know what? The regulations regarding rescues are very loose. You can do whatever you want. I thought it was just because that one time you got assigned for one as your partner when you were a beat cop. (laughs) I was a dirty cop at the time. I sold him out for some bananas. No, you were literally a dirty cop. You were filthy, covered with chimp lice. (laughs) (laughs) And Connor. Um, I'll go bad science. I mean, obviously hard to know if something like a, you know, chimp or crow could do something without being taught and seeing another chimp or crow do the same thing, but... You know, I'd imagine that given enough time, they could probably figure it out on their own. I mean, if enough of them can make Shakespeare with just a bunch of typewriters, then surely they could figure this out. That's also a cop show I'd watch, Chip and Crow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one, a volcano in a fairly populated area is set to explode with a similar force to Mount St. Helens. Damien thought this was false. Connor thought this was true. And this one is science. It's in Bali. There's a tourist destination that is fairly packed, so there's a lot of people going there, but there's also a lot of people who live around there. There's four and a half million people who live within the 100 kilometers of the Agung volcano, and nearly one million that live within 30 kilometers. They are doing a massive evacuation to this day when we are recording this podcast. It is up past 50,000 people they're having to get rid of because they're having these tremor quakes that usually indicate magma moving up into the volcano ready to burst. This thing is one of those things that steam all the time, but more of that is coming out. They are basically seeing this thing rumbling to life. And if this explodes like it did back in 1963, that produced a giant thing that actually caused a brief time of global cooling. So this is a big volcano. It looks like it might explode. If it does, a lot of people are going to be affected. It might be so big as to affect weather patterns here on the other side of the Earth, but it could kill quite a few people if it explodes violently like Mount St. Helens did. Imagine Mount St. Helens, but instead of being in rural Washington, you're in the middle of a densely populated area. I was listening to the news, and they mentioned this article, and they said that uh, uh, wildlife, monkeys and birds, had been acting funny. That is false. Uh, that, so that is like a rumor that people are saying, like, yes, monkeys are running out of the thing. N- nobody has observed that. They don't know. Monkeys are stupid as shit. They don't know when a volcano is going to blow up. I feel like you're, you're ignoring a monkey, uh, uh, you know, pantomiming. Uh, you know, b- he builds a little mound of dirt and right. pantomimes in the top blowing off. And he's trying to warn you, but stupid monkey, you, you can't, can't teach me. You can't even learn tools without me teaching you. All right. Article number two, a new study suggests that three or more cups of coffee a day double the risk of death among HIV and hepatitis sufferers. Damien thinks this is false. Connor thinks this is true. And this one is bad science. It's actually the opposite. A new study by French scientists have shown that three or more cups of coffee a day halved the risk of death among patients, meaning it cut it in half. So if you have HIV or hepatitis, it looks like this coffee is actually helping you stay alive. Now, 
as always, we need to warn you uh, in science fiction, causation correlation. It could be that the people who have three cups of coffee a day happen to have different lifestyle choices. Now, they, the article says they control for certain things, but I don't think you can always control for everything in those setups. It could be a different lifestyle. It could be a different predisposition. It could be a lot of different things. So we can't say for sure it's just the coffee. However, they are looking at it with controls that seem to suggest coffee is the main differentiating factor. And cutting death expectancy in half is a huge number. That's not 5%. Cutting it in half is a big deal. Could you get the same effects with a coffee enema? You can keep trying. <laughs> I can't wear pants anymore. <laughs> it's where a muumuu where things leak. Now, uh, caffeine, like Connor brought up, can still cause health problems. So this not necessarily means you should go out and do it. But multiple studies have shown that regular coffee consumption can also lead to longer lifespans. Caffeine is a drug. It has an effect on us. Not all drugs are bad effects. And like people say, the dose makes the poison. So some amount of caffeine might be very good for us, while excessive caffeine might be bad. Maybe a cup or two of coffee a day isn't necessarily super bad for you. Though, from what I hear, it's really bad for your teeth. All right. And on to article number three. A new study suggests you can tell if a person is unfaithful in their relationship simply by the sound of their voice. Both of you guys thought this one was false. And this one is science. So there's a lot of evidence that people speak in different ways when they are trying to hide something, including being unfaithful. This particular study had a bunch of people just speak normally, and they then asked them, have you ever cheated on your partner? No, I've never been on another science podcast. This is the (laughs) only, you're the only science podcast for me, Bobby. What do I have to do to prove it to you? I swear to Christ, if I hear you anywhere near Neil deGrasse Tyson again, I will kill you both. Neil, we can't see each other anymore. And they recorded them speaking, and then they later asked them privately, did you cheat on your... Have you ever cheated on your spouse or not? They got the ones that said they did, and then the ones that did not were their control. They would then have random people who had never heard these people before listen to the audio recordings of them and determine and just say, do you think this person cheats or not? People got it right a surprising amount of time. So it, it seems like they were much more likely than chance to guess whether or not that person was or was not a cheater. And that can be a lot of different elements of the voice. One of the theories that I have, that I've had for a long time, is a huge quality in cheating is clinical narcissists. Clinical narcissists cheat all the time. It's actually one of the telltale signs that somebody is a clinical narcissist. They have no care for what they're doing, for who they're hurting. I think you can detect subtle mental conditions without knowing it. Like, you know how you just get a bad feeling about people? Like, that dude's just off. He might not have done anything to you. You might not have anything wrong with him. He might not be saying or doing anything wrong. You just get a bad feeling that they're off. I think you're detecting certain subtle things. You're detecting maybe a bad childhood. You're detecting clinical narcissism. You're detecting borderline personality. You're detecting all of that. And I think some of that comes through in audio levels. And that might explain how... It's not like these guys have a magic ability to just pull out cheaters. I think they're pulling out broader mental issues that kind of come out in the way your voice expresses itself. Is it narcissism if you just thought you weren't going to get caught? Yes, that huh. I, I do believe that would make you still a narcissist. I'm going to disagree with you here because <laughs> I'm incapable of self-realization. And lastly, article number four, a new study confirms that chimps can use simple or complex tools, but only when instructed to do so, suggesting an interesting history of human interaction and teaching. Damien thinks this is science. Connor thinks this is bad science. And this one is bad science for the win. Good job, Connor. As always, our scientist guest beats Damien in a brutal brutal fashion but that's okay damien keep it's trucking not, along and as you, always but congratulations connor may one day be in connor's seat and winning one of these games one time who knows but uh, anything can happen even a chimp can learn to use a tool on his own so indeed i look forward to giving you hepatitis and aids <laughs> and depriving you of coffee so indeed they found out that they can spontaneously learn to use a tool even sometimes complex tools They would do this by watching chimps in nature to make sure they had no observation of humans at all. So they would watch chimps that had essentially never seen humans before, and they would utilize things like sticks to pull things out of the river, and they would do so without seeing another chimp do it. These were novel, what we call technological innovations. They had not seen it in that area before, and they would use these makeshift tools to do things. There was a thought for a while that chimps were capable of using tools but not innovating the use of tools they would see another chimp using it and they would use it and a lot of times people would say that's the evidence that we've had these interactions with these chimps for a long time because they saw our hominid ancestors making and using tools that's how they figured it out i think that's a silly presupposition because you can look at a chimp see their developmental abilities up until the age of three or four or something they're basically on par with homo sapiens At some point, this creature that's very intelligent is going to figure out how to learn a tool. Fuck, otters can use tools. Otters smash shells open using rocks on their bodies. 
Crows use tools. So many animals use tools. Why would we think that they somehow needed to be taught by us? So you you could theoretically see a champ filling in an Excel spreadsheet in nature, but you would never see him programming a spreadsheet program. That was the idea, yes. Yeah. By the way, chimp in a business suit, still a great bit <laughs> to this day. You What's know, he chimp, selling, you on, the, on the little Excel <laughs> spreadsheet and stuff. Uh, very, very good, Connor. Congratulations on your win, and welcome back. Thank you, audience, for coming back to Science Faction 195, where you learned about Australopithecus africanus, evaporation power generation, how Zika got bad, how a volcano in a very densely populated area is about to blow, how coffee might save you if you have HIV or hepatitis, how to tell if a person is unfaithful by the sound of their voice, and how chimps can learn to use complex tools all on their own. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 196. Ugh, do not talk to me in the morning until I've had my coffee. Or I'll give you AIDS. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Mm-hmm.